Right, welcome back for the second session. Uh, thank you for joining in. Hope you had a good break. Uh, right, Pastor Jakes will continue uh, with the second session as well. Also, over to you, Pastor Jakes. Right, thanks. Uh, thanks, Roshan. Okay, so I think uh, Sid and uh, well, I think Dave has already mentioned that he's not joining. Okay, right. Okay, so. Um, We'll just continue uh, with where we stop. So we looked at uh, you know the importance of what happens uh, when we worship together as a congregation, right? So so we see the beauty of it. We see the importance of it. So uh, so how do we bring that about in our congregation? You know, um, I, I'm sure you know you've been to uh, maybe a, some visited a church or maybe went for a conference. And uh, and you we saw you heard and you were part of this uh, worship time and and you just wonder you know how how is it it's how is it it's so wonderful how is it it's so um, you know beautiful here and you know uh, how can we have that in the place where I am from you know, how can we have the same thing right uh, what can we do to have the same thing right so. Um, uh, uh, I remember attending a worship uh, conference and then uh, just seeing, you know, people just worshiping God and, uh, and un in an uninhibited manner, uh, just expressing their worship to God. And, and it's so wonderful things were happening, right? Um, so then the person who was uh, sharing the word says, said that, you know, this is not something that happened uh, today or yesterday. Uh, it's not because of something that happened today or yesterday. Uh, it's It's... It's been a culture. Right? It's something that has been laid out uh, through the years. Right? And that is how we are where we are today. Right? Um, and I'm sure, you know, even in our personal lives, you know, we are where we are because of some of the things that we have done and we keep doing, right? We have arrived where we are. So, um, so similarly, you know, uh, when we look at the church, when we look at uh, the fellowship, that when we want to bring in something, you know, saying, okay, I want to develop the congregation in worship, then we see that it is something that uh, that is going to take time, right? it is going to be a journey, and uh, it, uh, it involves intentionally putting down something that, that we call as culture, right? a culture of worship, right? Um, so let's um, yeah. Let me just share the uh, text again. Um, sorry. Okay. Okay. There we go. Okay. So um, so uh, we we need to be uh, you know creating a culture of worship or putting down a culture or developing a culture of worship okay um now when you look at the word culture okay this is what the dictionary says you know it's, uh, one definition of culture is um, the ideas customs and social behavior okay ideas customs uh, social behavior of a particular people or society so that is that is what we normally call as culture so when we say a culture of worship um the the again you know transferring this you see the ideas the customs and and the manner in which uh, we worship right um so culture you know it can be good or bad it can be misplaced it can be um, you know it can it need not be based on truth you know you have certain culture and uh, certain traditions and it need not be it need not be um, edifying, right? It, it need not be truthful. It need it can be, you know, it can be something that is totally false. It can be something that's um, even um, what do you what do you say? Um, uh, something that is not edifying the body. Something that's um, bringing in damage rather than something good to the body. So we need to be careful, you know, what kind of culture that we are um, building. In, in the church, like right, among the people. And the thing about culture is that it's like an unwritten rule, right? It's, uh, it's, it's not something that is there as a instruction manual. You know, it's it's there, you know, it's, it's, um, it, it's, but it has to be intentionally developed, but still it's there, you know, you just walk in and then you, you feel, okay, the, 
this is how it is. Hey, this place is friendly, or this place is, oh, uh, when I, it's intimidating. You know, it's 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 the culture which is there. Uh, right? I remember the the place where I worked. Uh, you know, initially uh, the first two places where I worked, I I was required to wear a tie to office. Okay, so wear a tie to office and go and so the, that was the culture, right? And that was something that was laid down. And then the another place where I worked, the last place where I worked, um, uh, like uh, you don't have to wear a tie. You just go right? I fully, you know, wearing a tie and all, and then going all formal. And they said, "Hey, uh, at the interview, I think you don't have to wear a tie. You know, you, you don't have to." So, so you you see that uh, the culture, and you you address people by their first names. You know, it might be a vice president of the company, and you don't have to call that person as sir. Um, you just call them by a first name. You say, "Hey, hey, John," uh, and you know that's a that's a culture there. Right? Similarly, a culture of worship. Which is based on truth, right? Which is based on the truth. Which is based on whatever we have learned in the last session. You know, this is what can happen. So, how do we build a culture of worship? Okay. Uh, the first um, thing we look, look at four four things. You know, if you want to break it down, uh, what will actually bring in that kind of a culture of worship? First thing is the revelation. You know, meaning that uh, an awareness, uh, an uncovering of spiritual truth right a revelation of truth it's like my eyes are open to the truth right this is this is something that is scriptural you know maybe it, it could be about worship itself you know i remember one person saying uh, you know uh, we don't need to have worship you know we don't need to have singing uh, before uh, before our time of preaching, you know, anyway, uh, God's presence is there. Just singing just won't bring in the presence. I already God's presence is there. I don't need to sing, and I'm straight away get into the message, right? So, um, like, I know people are there, right, with different backgrounds, different church backgrounds. Um, so it's it it uh, it's good to have a, a common uh, understanding of what worship is. Right? So, a revelation about worship. Okay. And and that revelation, that spiritual awareness or uncovering, that happens when we when there, there is a teaching. Okay, when there is a teaching on it. Okay, um, like uh, uh, you know, if you look at Isaiah six and verses one to eight, and uh, I'm not putting the verses there, but you see that Isaiah has a revelation, and his his eyes are opened to the uh, the holiness of god his eyes are open to the the, the amazing um, the way in which god is worshiped and he hears these things he sees these things he has this encounter right he has this encounter and there's a revelation of the holiness of god and the and the beauty of god and the, and the awesomeness of god right we see that in isaiah 6 verse verses 1 following right so uh, there needs to be uh, a teaching that leads to an encounter. There, when there's a teaching, then people see for themselves, okay, this is what the Bible says. You know, a teaching on the expressions of worship. Okay. Uh, because people think, hey, this is for young people. Okay, this uh, dancing, this jumping, it's for young people. Uh, this lifting of hands, uh, it's for the Pentecostal church. This clapping, oh, it's its for those people who wear white. <laughs> you know, uh, all those kind of things. You know, oh, this is so undignified, right? Because people come with all these baggages or backgrounds, and but they are sincere. You know, it's not that uh, they, they have anything against they are They're sincere. Um, and this is their understanding, right? So when there is a revelation, there will be change. You know, you, 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 and when there's a, you know when when they act on that revelation there will be change but that revelation about uh, we are specifically talking about worship will come when there is a teaching right when we when we teach when we uh, and that teaching can come in several ways uh, one you know there could be probably a, a message or a sermon series um so formally, at the time, so there is a teaching uh, about the, the, about worship, different aspects of worship. Okay, or it could be even during the exhortation, a time of exhortation where the worship leader or the worship team is there, and there's an exhortation. And uh, you know, typically you look at uh, let's say Psalm 95, and you see that several postures of worship are, are there. You know, um, if you can turn there, Psalm 95. 
talks about you know singing shouting uh, coming before his presence with thanksgiving uh, shouting joyfully um, and kneeling down uh, and bowing down and we see all those um, you know mentioned there in, in those few verses right so you know, something like that it can be a short time of exhortation before we actually start um, that uh, you know lead people into worship so there can be uh, it can be a powerful time I mean, one aspect of it one thing and then maybe that person has never seen that before never heard that before or maybe you know even clapping of hands and and you see that in scripture and then you see that okay this is something i can do oh this shouting thing it's not just an emotional outburst but it's actually scriptural and there's something there that something happens and god has laid that there put it there for a purpose right so there is teaching and there, there is revelation from which, which uh, the holy spirit brings is the one who guides us into all truth right he's the one who opens uh, opens our hearts opens our understanding and uh, he, he shows us what truth is right so there is by uh, teaching um so um okay let me just put it so the first thing is uh, okay when there's teaching um secondly it's also by a demonstration okay by example so it's by demonstration which means that uh, it's not enough for me to teach but i need to do okay now as a pastor if i'm teaching on worship uh, the people will look at me when there is a time of worship to see what i actually do right and um, you know, maybe as a pastor or a spiritual or a leader, and if I'm, you know, if I'm disinterested, if I'm just standing there like that, or if I'm checking my phone, uh, or if I'm talking to someone during the time of uh, during the time of corporate worship, then I'm sending a different message, right? Even though we might have a like a four part series with you know audio visuals and everything, we are sending a different message when we demonstrate when we uh, when we live it out, right? So it has to be both. It's ha it has to be in practice. It has to be in precept, in principle, you know, what we are teaching. So when both go hand in hand, uh, it is something which is very, very powerful. So as a, you know, as a ministry team, as a pastoral team, we we engage in worship, right? Uh, and, and not just to show others that, hey, I'm a worshiper, but, you know, truthfully, you know, you know, this is the truth. And so you, you engage in worship and, uh, and there's a lot that the congregation also picks up when the leaders engage in worship. Like if the leader does not, um, give, I mean, maybe, you know, as a worship leader or as a worship minister, as a, as a worship pastor, I mean, if I'm on stage, if I'm, you know, worshiping God, but then off stage, if I, if I do not, right. Um, uh, when I'm sitting in the church, in the congregation, if I do not engage in worship, then I'm again, sending a different message. So teaching comes by, uh, you know, revelation comes by teaching and by demonstration. Right. We we show we demonstrate by example, and that's why um, Paul uh, writes to Timothy, and uh, I think it's in First uh, Timothy four and verse twelve. Um, okay, let me uh, just get that verse. First um, Timothy four, and this is verse twelve. Okay. Yeah, First Timothy four twelve. There's a, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers. Okay, so if, if you look at the verses before that, um, he's uh, and also after that, he's talk, talking to Timothy about the importance of the word and how he needs to uh, rightly divide the word and so on. Um, and 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 then here he says, um, uh, even after this, right? He says, give attention to reading, exhortation, doctrine. Verse thirteen. But in verse 12, he says, you know, let no one despise you, but you be you be an example to the believers. And he writes uh, six things, I think, yeah. In word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity, right? So he writes about this, you know, you be an example to the believers. They're, they're looking to you, they are looking at you, and um, it's not enough just, you know, when you, when you just teach, but you need, your life needs to show it. So um, there's, there can be a powerful, Thing, you know when you say okay lift your hands and you lift your hands or if you're you know when you say shout and you're shouting when you say you know whatever um there you are showing by example you're demonstrating 
to the to the church that this is what it is so there is a revelation which comes right the second one what revelation will bring about is conviction okay so what conviction is that uh, it's 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 um, uh, it's confidence and uh, okay maybe confidence is a wrong word conviction is you know for sure in your heart that something to be true something that to be right uh, is a conviction it's it's a deep down in your heart you are sure that this is what this is what uh, uh, it's true it, it, this is truth okay um so when you are convicted in your heart then uh, th now that conviction is very very important for action right because uh, otherwise sorry, you might sorry, do it because uh, yeah sorry to interrupt uh, the screen has gone blank yeah. i'm not sure if it's uh... Oh, I see. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, is it okay now? Is it <laughs> yes, okay now? now we can see. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, okay. okay. Thanks. I think when sorry. I minimize yeah. it, it just goes blank. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so conviction, right? Uh, so it's something that uh, you are convinced about something. It's something that you are strongly believe in, right? That's uh, conviction. So, um, so conviction is very, very important, right? Because um, we might do certain things because somebody is saying it and when you move that somebody out of the way you won't continue in it right uh, you might have you might say something okay I, okay this guy is you know putting pressure on me let me do it but you yourself personally are not convicted right but when you are convicted then irrespective of whether that person is there or not you will still do it Right. Whether you're alone or whether, whether you're with you know, a different set of people, you will still do it because you are convicted. You believe strongly in it. Okay, so revelation brings about conviction, right? Internally, uh, and and of course, you know, we are, we are depending on the spirit of God, and there's nothing like what the spirit of God, how He can expose truth, explain truth, truth to us. Right, in a way we understand and sometimes we, we don't even know the reasons but we know deeply that hey this is true and that's the work of the spirit right so it brings about conviction and when we are convicted when there is conviction then there is action we are moved to act upon it we are moved to action we say okay uh I, I know I don't feel like it, but I'm but, but I'm convicted in my, in my heart. I know this is true. Let me do it. Right? I I know people are watching, but hey, but I know that you know in my heart I know to be true that God is worthy of praise and worship. And I, I know I'm a shy person, but you know I don't care. Yeah, <laughs> you know you come to that place of action because you are you are you know convicted. You know you know this to be true. Right? So conviction leads to action and you see you know it's wonderful to see people different temperaments different church backgrounds and they are coming there and they've made that journey those steps of you know be, uh, having received the teaching revelation and having been convicted in their hearts and having that experience and moving to action Right. You see people just opening up, worshiping God. People who, uh, I remember in our life group, you know, uh, we used to have uh, a life group those days. And uh, there's one person who will never pray out in public. Never pray in public. Whenever, you know, we'll, we used to have a notebook, write down prayer points, and then you just pass it. Okay. So the, you, you're supposed to, you know, take the next prayer point, read it out, pray. Whenever it comes to him, he'll say, pass. You know, he did that for many, many years. Till such time that he had a, you know, a, a revelation, an understanding, and he was able to, he said, okay, I, I'm going to take the step. I'm going to pray out loud. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing that's going to happen. Um, there's nothing bad that will have come out of it. I'm going to take that step. I'm going to do it. Right? So, uh, and then even in corporate worship, we saw the same thing that it was very inhibited, but then was able to you know uh, just open up and worship so imagine if that happens to the entire congregation right and as leaders uh, we need to facilitate that and not hinder that not hamper that right uh, sometimes uh, like in our enthusiasm we hamper it in the sense you know we say okay, come on come on why don't you do this dad? and then people are going further and further into the shell into their caves they're saying no no i, I can't i won't right? but when we teach and when there is a conviction, then there will be action, right? So that action leads to 
destiny, right? Where things were closed and maybe they were headed somewhere. Now they are headed to a different destination itself. It, it changes the destiny. Um, it changes it. It changes the spiritual level uh, of the uh, of the church. It changes the spiritual atmosphere of the church. And because here we see people who are um, maybe indifferent to worship, right? Indifferent to uh, maybe the things of God, coming to a place of hungering after the presence of God. You see, in your own lives, how did it happen? It was a journey. Right? It was a journey, constant, constant revelation, your understanding, you saw it in the word, uh, you experienced, you had an encounter with God, and it changed the way you pray, the way you worship, the way you live, everything changed, right? It was a journey. So we need to, uh, we need to, of course, give time, and we need to understand that it's a journey, that it's going to be a process, but um, we need to keep at it, right? So those four things, you know, revelation, conviction, action, and destiny, right? And uh, maybe we should just look at Isaiah chapter six. It's it's wonderful when we um, when we see um, the kind of thing that happens. Isaiah six, uh, you know, verses one. Um, let me just read. In in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Right? And, uh, and and then I'm just. Uh, Sorry, uh, yeah, let me just read. Yeah. Fill the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. With two, he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with so smoke. Okay, Verse 5. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So Isaiah has this, has this encounter, and, uh, and that results in a revelation, his eyes being opened. He sees the holiness of God. He sees the, you know, the beauty of God in his temple. And he sees him, himself for who he is. He sees himself and he says, oh, you know, I, 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 I was doing the right things. I was saying the right things. But I see now that I'm a man of unclean lips. And I see my environment and we are, I'm in the midst of a people of unclean lips. I have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Right? And from then on, you know, there's something else happens. Um, then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Okay. And I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Okay. Now, first he sees he's a man of unclean lips. He's dwelling among a people of unclean lips. He's, he says, you know, he says, woe is me. Oh, I, I'm actually cursed. You know, I, bad things are going to happen to me. Woe is me. I'm undone. Okay. Um, but then he has, he receives this word. He, he receives this message. And he has this experience of the coal being touched, the coal from the altar touching his lips. And and the word that this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away, your sin purged. Okay. And that results in something in his heart that there is a change. You know, he, he's no more saying, you know, I am a man of unclean lips. He's coming to the place of confidence and he's saying, Here I am, send me. What resulted in that? Right? What resulted in that? He says, uh, you know, in response to the question, whom, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. Okay. There is a complete change. There's something deep, deeply, you know, he's, he's, something has happened in his heart. And he's received that message of cleansing and, uh, and purification, and his sin being taken away. And he sees suddenly this confidence, confidence to serve the one with whom he has had an encounter, with whom he had seen the beauty. And he says, here I am, send me. Okay. So, you know, just transferring that to worship 
a worship ministry and you know building that culture when people have that encounter when people have or receive the revelation right uh, revelation by teaching by demonstration and i think the third thing we can add is also by encounter there's nothing to replace that you know they just encounter and that's the best lesson uh, uh, ever that leads to conviction and that leads to action they take a step and and you see more and more of people um participating engaging going after god okay it's not just um an enthu crowd right you can have an enthu crowd but not really deep happening you know people not not really engaging with god you know enthusiasm doesn't mean that they're engaging with god you know something deep has to happen in their hearts in their hearts they they're pursuing in their hearts they're going after god in their hearts in when they sing they are they're really meaning it right so um so they're engaging they're going after okay um okay some some other practical things when we uh, developing the uh, culture of worship in our own lives is of course to study the word of god which results in revelation teaching right praying um which results in encounter which uh, god again reveals his truth to us and it gets ingrained in us um and uh, and what uh, what really helps us as um, worship ministers is to expose ourselves you know to different um, uh, styles of worship right um and and saying okay uh, yeah there's a place here you know there's a place in in worship for this as well right uh, which is which is rooted in scripture it's just not a, you know it's not something it's not a fad right? different f- forms and styles of worship uh, there is a place for maybe reading of scripture reading of prayer there is a place for spontaneity and overflow of the heart there is a place for declaration of truth you know powerfully vociferously there is a place of um, you know being in that uh, being in awe of god and there, there are no words Right? there are no words there are no songs there are no music and and there is that moment of uh, just contemplating and looking at the beauty of god now, there is a place for that right um uh, while well some we know that some churches can be very very expressive in their praise and worship praise uh, but not really so in you know in in terms of adoration of god and and some maybe the so when we look at our own churches um places of places where we are fellowshipping we know okay hey, this is something that we can go further in these are something this is this is one area where we are, we are strong right um so when we study when we study the different expressions of worship when we study that you know different forms the different styles we understand that okay and maybe we can take the congregation you know into that right um yeah um okay so i think we we've come to the end of uh, you know chapter 7 so we've kind of understood what we need to do um to to develop a culture of worship you know i just wanted to say that um uh, that it's it's going to take time okay it's going to take time you know if it is if it is a church which is which already has a certain form of worship then it's going to be even more difficult right but if it's a, if it's a church that is being planted and something that is um, so started afresh then you know it's going to be so much uh, relatively easier in comparison but you know because you're starting right with you know you're starting from the first step with the right foundation so uh, you know you're just laying the steps there so but it's 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 it will it's a journey that we all make um, and as our understanding of god deepens as our, our encounter with god you know happens then we see this culture of worship getting deeply ingrained okay and flourishing and thriving uh, will there be attacks against the culture of worship yes Right. we need to god we need to be on god um will they, it can come in various ways like you know discouragement or you know maybe uh, you know maybe um uh, a certain coldness towards uh, worship itself um so we need to guard ourselves personally and guard the ministry team itself you know when i notice it you know we just encourage the people share people uh, and maybe you know uh, sometimes it could be a misplaced focus a focus on you know uh maybe uh, on something else 
time something else um, uh, maybe a focus on maybe a focus on the form and not really the the heart of worship right so those are times when we can encourage uh, the team encourage the ministers to slowly just come back hey this is what it's about right um yeah so any any questions here if oh roshan if you want to share something more um uh, no, but uh, as in uh, uh, there's a book called uh, Leadership Pain, okay, by uh, Sam mm -hmm. Chan. Okay. Sorry, I think I muted myself there. Uh, leadership Pain, is it? Yeah. Le leadership Pain by mm -hmm. Sam Chan. Um, he says about culture that uh, you know no matter how good a vision is if the culture is not healthy uh you know people will not like being around for ex and the example that he gave was uh, imagine serving a delicious food on a dirty mm. plate <laughs> like so no matter how delicious and how beautiful the food looks you will still mm. not eat off a dirty plate and so right. you're referring to culture as that and um so I think mm. in, individually, all of us, uh, you know, wherever God places us, uh, you know, we just look, look, you have a vision for wherever mm. God places you for the ministry that you're in. And then, uh, and if the culture, if you don't set the culture as a leader, and I think the culture will be set for you, you know, mm. you might like it or not like it. Yeah. Um, so I think, uh, you know, it's beautifully put across, uh, you know, and uh, mm. so, yeah, that's the only thing. But, uh, yeah, yeah, so true, yeah. so true. Yeah, um, yeah, and then we, we sometimes realize, you know, where, where is the struggle? You know, we're doing all this, and then, but then yeah. you look and then you see that uh, we need to, it's uh, we need to change the culture because it's uh, it's something that you, it's uh, it's un, unwritten, something that you, um, everybody picks up, right? Uh, uh, maybe somebody just joins new, they just pick up because that's what. That's what everybody is doing. The custom is that, um, so we need to be careful. Yeah. Okay. okay any questions? Uh, anyone? Okay. So, um, so I would just say, you know, just be uh, aware of this. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, and you initiate this. You know, as a leader, if you're there. You know, you initiate it um, and then establish it and build it intentionally. Uh, maybe the culture is already set. Uh, you know, maybe you're serving in a team, and uh, maybe some of us are in that place. You know, serving there, there is a culture. Just maybe one of the exercises that you can do is you know, find out what is it. You know, what is health healthy about this? What is unhealthy about this? Um, and you know, that would be a good way for us to be. Uh, you know, uh, for us to get exposed, for us to be become sensitive, become aware of, okay, these are some intangibles, you know, that I see. You know, these are this is a culture here, and uh, and so you know, uh, wherever you can bring in a change, you know, so change is always brought up. Uh, uh, we can do our bit, right? But uh, it is it needs to be set by the leaders, right? So that's um, uh, that is something that. You know, you can do as a leader, or you can have a conversation with your with a leader, and say, "Hey, we need to. This is uh, this is not healthy, right?" Um, of course, we're talking about the team uh, and so on, right? Okay, so let's um, continue. Uh, we are, we are going on to uh, chapter eight, which is uh, um, yeah, which is uh, uh, which is about. Uh, indigenous and regional languages and expressions, right? Indigenous worship meaning. Um, you know, worship in your own language, and uh, you know how uh, will that help? How will that help? Um, let's look at that. Okay, let's look at some. Okay. See now, um, when we look at our country, you know, our nation, India, you know, we—it's uh, a very complicated place, right? I, complicated in the sense it's a complex place. You know, like if you look at our own classroom, we see people from, uh, you know, different uh, parts of our nation. And uh, yeah, maybe I'll just uh, minimize this. Okay. We, we different parts of our nation, like Siddhis from Mysore, Princess from somewhere up north, you know, uh, Kiran is in 
Calcutta, uh, Kannan down South Tamil Nadu, you know, uh, and we, here we are, you know, sitting in Bangalore and, and different languages, you know, we are aware of different languages, we, are, we speak different languages. Um, and uh, you know we we feel comfortable worship worshiping the lord in in a in a in a certain language okay now let me tell you my uh, my comfort level and whatever you know i speak uh, my mother tongue is tamil right so we speak tamil at home um uh, for the most part i speak tamil with a lot of my relatives and so on um so that is my mother tongue but when I, the the church that I went to, right, we, we it was an English speaking church. Uh, for whatever reason, we went there, and when I accepted the Lord, I prayed in English. Okay, it was not in Tamil. I I prayed in English, and uh, uh, the songs that I sang to Him in worship were in English. Uh, everything worship was in English, and so on. Right, so it's not that. I cannot pray or I cannot sing in Tamil or worship God in Tamil, but I feel much more comfortable in English. Okay, so that is see you see that's that's one complexity. Okay, one level of complexity. Though I know the language, I uh, and I'm from a different language background. I speak comfortable. I, I am comfortable in in this language. Right, worshiping God. So in uh, uh, yeah, uh, Kiran, I'm just putting it back. Okay, so so in a congregation, especially in a country like India, we need to understand, of course, where are we, first of all, where has God placed us, and who are the people who are coming to worship? Okay, who are the people? And, uh, you know, God has anointed you and, you know, given you a vision to reach a people with a message, and you're the messenger, you're the man, uh, you're the messenger. And so... Uh, we need to understand our congregation and see, um, okay, um, you know, uh, what what is the kind of congregation? What is the demographics? You know, their age, their their language, uh, etc. Okay, um, so and it's 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 a little more it's it's a little complex because, like I said, you know, you might be from a certain part of the nation, you might be speaking a certain lang uh, language at home, but you are comfortable worshiping God, um, you know, in a different language altogether. Right, so so all this, uh, it, it is it, all, all these are factors. So we need to we need to understand it. Now we may not be able to, just because in the congregation you have twenty percent of you know people speaking uh, Tamil, we have twenty percent of people speaking Malayalam, you have twenty percent, you know, maybe fifty percent speaking Kannada, or you know, we cannot cater to everybody. You know, it's it's going to be difficult, right? Um, but at least you know that okay, um, majority. You know, ninety percent of the people are comfortable, or pray in this particular language, are okay with this language. Then, um, you know, we let's have the worship in that particular language. Okay, so um, so uh, language is uh, is one main thing that we uh, that we need to consider. Okay, uh, uh, when it comes to worship. Okay, the second thing is also the genre of music. So you see, this is another layer, like language. Okay, you have so many. Um, you kind of decide. Okay, this is what, this is the language we can go with, right? For most of the, for the most part. Then there is a genre of music also, you know, which is, which is again, um, not a major factor, but it is a factor, right? Um, maybe your, let's say, Carnatic music, or, or Indian classical. And uh, and you you as a leader and this is something that you you you're you're exposed to. This is what you can relate to, and this is what you are. Maybe the worship team is skilled at, and and if you see that, you know the congregation is not really engaging with that, uh, then maybe it's, it's time to relook, right? Or maybe the congregation is something uh, you know it can engage with this, are familiar with this genre of music. You know, uh, maybe uh, the instruments that we use, uh, and so on. Um, then, by all means, we can go with that. Okay, so genre of music also very important. You know, like sometimes people say, "No, yeah, you're an Indian. What is this? You're playing all. Uh, you know, you should use tabla. You should have Indian instruments. We should have Indian instruments." Well, 
nothing wrong definitely we can but you know is it something that people can relate to like i'll tell you for example you know in one of our locations north apc north uh, i was just thinking about it this morning you know uh, i went to lead worship once okay then i when i when i went up when i went up front i was wondering you know is it india or some other country <laughs> right this was at a time when we had a lot of african students from uganda from you know other a lot of african students and uh, they would come uh, we had a you know like we had a bus facility arranged and so on so i went up and i saw you know 50 i think you guys most of you you know you were here you you would helped out in north um, location i went there and i saw about 50 or 60 uh, students and they're all africans I felt that they were, you know, I maybe I'm in I'm in a different country altogether, all Africans, and um, uh, you know, and so a Hindi song will not make a you know will not cut the, cut things through, right? Uh, of course, you know they were very very accommodative, and we used to do songs like you know Yeshu Tera Naam and you know other songs. They they were very very into. They learned the songs and so on. But but you know. The minute you see, uh, I, I, I was there, you know, I used to go there on and off and I, and I saw a bunch of African students leading worship, right? Uh, we used to have some friends, uh, um, uh, African students who were part of the worship team. Uh, maybe you've met some of them, Rebecca, Andrew, and so they, they were leading worship. So they sang, uh, they, they sang a little differently. The, the, the beat was a little different. The percussion was, a, you know, was a little different and they sang, um, one of one, I don't know which African, maybe it was Swahili or something. They sang that, and the place exploded, right? I'm I'm at the back. I'm just watching uh, the the place just moved. You know, it, it was different to when I was leading. You know, how why didn't this happen? <laughs> you know, it was not that. You know, the power, God's presence was not there. God's power was not there. But it's just that people were open. People were uh, uh, you know engaging differently. And the same thing happened when we went to Siliguri. It was when we went to Siliguri, we sang Hindi songs. Okay. Now these were these were we went on a mission trip. These were people from uh, from uh, from West Bengal actually, right? So they were from Calcutta. They were from other places. They had come. Now we said, okay, we are going north. As far as you know, for any anywhere from <laughs> from the southern state, we are pushing up. That's north. So we'll sing in Hindi. Okay. So we sang Hindi songs, and we went ahead with the Hindi songs that we knew. Know, like uh, the songs that you guys would have probably heard, you know, Yeshu um, yeah, you know, Hoteri Stuti or Aradhana or, you know, Hamgaya uh, Hosanna and, and all those songs. Um, and then something was not happening, right? Um, and then th there was a group which came from, um, I forget the place, again from West Bengal somewhere, they came and uh, they played. The place, people who were, you know, finding it difficult to lift their hands were now dancing, right? What was the difference? One, they sang in Bengali. Two, the genre of music was different. Like here we were, even though we were singing Hindi, like our, the, the genre of music was very, very Western. Right, uh, it was, that is what we knew. That is what we were exposed to. So we would build up, you know, dynamically. We would build up. We would, you know, bring it down. Here, there was only one dynamic, level ten, throughout. Okay, they will start, and then the beat would be, you know, typical folk beat. You know, you know, that is how it would be the whole song. But the place exploded in worship. So it's not, you know, it's whether it's good, bad, whether it's, you know, it's just that people are able to engage. They are, this is what they're exposed to. This is what they it brings them out, and they engage. So language, genre of music, and genre of music, of course, helps us in uh, you know choosing what what instruments do we use when it comes to percussion. Do we use a drum? Do we use a dholak? Do we use a mridangam? Do we use um, you know? Having said all that, I know that you know God's presence will cover right. Uh, God's presence will cover everything, but um, we need to be, it's it's good for us as worship ministers to be uh, aware of that, to be sensitive to this um, so that we can facilitate, right? Uh, this. And sometimes we need to make some sacrifices. Um, I'm, I, you know, I'm thinking of William Carey. William Carey, when he came to in, uh, from England, like, he, you know, he worked in a 
cobbler shop, cobbler by profession, you know, making shoes and uh, uh, studied theology on his free time during his lunch break and everything, studied the Bible um, and, um, and then came here and learned the language and uh, he ministered, you know, by the Bible translation. Of course, God has called him, God called him for that particular unique uh, call, mission, right? Uh, translated the Bible into several Indian languages, uh, including Hindi, a lot of South Indian languages. He learned it, he translated it, he had someone teach him. Uh, in fact, uh, I think uh, it was a Hindu priest who was there who taught him Sanskrit. So he did all that, you know. You, so it's going to, you know, make us uncomfortable, right? See, I, I have never sung Hindi songs, uh, you know, for, for me. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's really an effort, you know. And, and I remember the time that uh, Roshan and I, we went to Chandigarh for a missions trip. And, uh, and, and then the plan was that we'll have a half night of prayer and worship. But the thing is, it's going to be in Hindi, you know. We went with a lot of dependence, a lot of fear and trembling, <laughs> uh, because none of us were, you know, Hindi speakers, right? So, but we had to kind of improvise. We had a translator, thankfully, who could speak in Hindi, uh, when, who was translating in Hindi, who could sing in Hindi. So that helped. So we would sing something spontaneous. He would not only translate, but sing that same thing, a, a prophetic uh, phrase or utterance. He would sing it in Hindi. So that helped. So we, we had, I, I'm saying that, you know, it, it, it is not our comfort zone, right? Uh, it's great to have people who would actually do it uh, thing, but as um, you know, uh, people as uh, worship ministers to be sensitive, to be aware, um, and to facilitate others in uh, in that. Right. So here are some practical things that we could look at. Okay, I think we we'll just go through this quickly. One is to have the a language service. Okay, let's say okay, you have a lot of Hindi speaking people uh, or uh, speak people who speak Kannada or whatever language, and you say okay, we're going to have this language. Okay, since the majority, you know, we have a lot of people, there is a need, we have a Kannada service, or we have a Hindi service, then, you know, we are able to help uh, better. If that is not possible, then we could have the songs that we are doing, we could probably learn the language, and then, uh, or, you know, learn those songs and sing it. Or we could see if the same song that we're singing, is it there in Hindi? Or is it there in another language, like a bilingual? So you could sing that as well use that in worship right um so yeah so since not all songs have translations in the local language we might have to you know translate it we might have to do that um uh, and we might have to sing a few songs maybe maybe a new song uh, learn a new song in that language alone which helps you know and and time and uh, over and over again you know we've seen that uh, that it really opens up people's heart to worship God, right? Which is which is really the um, objective of every worship minister. Right? We, we are, you are there to worship God personally, but you are also there to facilitate and and uh, and enable the church to worship, even as you worship God, right? Um, so uh, so that's uh, the objective of the worship minister. So yeah, okay. Uh, another thing to keep in mind. Uh, if you're singing a song in another language, uh, be very careful, right? Learn to pronounce the words the right way, because uh, if you learned it the wrong way, if you're pronouncing it the wrong way, it could be, you know, a, a totally different meaning in that language and uh, it'll be embarrassing. Uh, and people, uh, you know, people will be hindered more than helped, right? So uh, learn to pronounce the words the right way and say it in the right, uh, sing it in the right manner, um, then it won't be distracting to the worshipers. Right? And it will also help if the worship leader knows the language and can transition into exhorting in that language. Now, not only just singing, but exhorting, right? Uh, leading the congregation, saying God is good, or come, you know, why don't you lift your hands and worship? Saying those words or exhorting the congregation in the language greatly helps. Right? So you could do that. Uh, uh, we could probably have someone else on the team who can speak and you can exhort uh, the congregation. Right. So this is something for us to be um, aware of and to be sensitive to, especially in a country like us. 
right uh, i don't know how many other nations have this uh, you know have this as a challenge but um, definitely uh, in our nation we you know we need to consider this and we need to be sensitive to this okay so that brings us to the end of you know this um, session on vaccine and especially corporate things which um, you know which are pertaining to corporate worship okay uh, back to you roshan yeah. okay. thank you pastor uh, thank you so much hey can we just take a minute and just thank pastor jakes for uh, taking his time off the only day where he doesn't have to take bible calls classes <laughs> and uh, it is it, it is it is just good uh, yeah it's yeah good. Thank you, Pastor. Thank okay. you for sharing. Also, I think there's so much to learn from just your experience and uh, and everything. Yeah. Um, so, Thanks, God. thank you, everybody, for joining in. Uh, we'll meet once again for uh, a session next week. Okay. Uh, until then, you guys, I'll take care. I'll see you also next week. Okay. Thanks, Pastor. See you guys. See you. God bless. Bye, Sid. Thanks, Bye, Kiran. Take care. Bye. Thank you, sir.